In our last session, we were looking at Pharaoh appointing Joseph to be prime minister. Pharaoh listened to him after he had been bought, brought out of prison at the cupbearer's request. And uh, it was a politically motivated thing. Obviously, the cupbearer had gotten out of prison. And Joseph had accurately predicted this through his dream. And he told him that these dreams came from God. They don't come from me. And Joseph tells Pharaoh what he has to do. He said, look, the dreams that you've had are one dream. There's going to be seven years of really a bumper crop here. And you need to do something with that. And then there's going to be seven years of famine. He says, you need to get somebody in charge of the entire economy, especially the agricultural aspect of it in Egypt, to uh, store up for those seven years. And then you need to get somebody that's going to manage this over the next seven years to let it back out so that Egypt does not suffer this famine. And uh, Pharaoh looks over at his overseers here, or should I say his soothsayers, and they couldn't understand the dream. They couldn't answer him. And he says, uh, can we find someone as this? Is there someone there in whom the Spirit of God is? And uh, they probably thought that they were going to be chosen. I mean, certainly Pharaoh's not going to pick this guy that he just dragged out of prison. <laughs> but he's starting to lean towards this kid, you know. He's believing what he says here. Well, he's not a kid anymore. He's almost 30. And... Uh, but they're silence. They, I mean, they just don't say anything. So they probably expected that they were going to get chosen. And then when they didn't get chosen, they had nothing to say. Now, the term is interesting here. This usually gets translated out in our English Bibles as the Spirit of God with a big G. That's not how the Hebrew reads. The Hebrew reads Ruach Elohim. Ruach Elohim. And the word Elohim by itself is just a generic term for God. I mean, it's used throughout the Old Testament to mean just the pagan God or um, the God of the universe. If it's coupled with his proper name, his proper personal name, Yahweh, or the Germans call it Jehovah. But this, I, I believe, this is just simply referring to some generic God. Because Pharaoh doesn't know uh, Jehovah God. He doesn't know who that is. But he's saying that, man, there's something supernatural going on with this guy here, you know? And, um, and this must be the guy in whom the spirit of some God exists. Let's appoint him. So he goes on to repeat Joseph's own words about a person so wise and discerning, and he doesn't make any haste or doesn't waste any time, if you will, selecting Joseph because he saw this supernatural guidance that Joseph has and Joseph doesn't look at himself as being the, um, the author, the originator of these dreams. He attributes it all to God. All to God. God gave me these things. So he gets appointed prime minister. Now let's just backtrack for a couple minutes. Joseph is in Canaan. His brothers hate him because he's beloved by his dad. He has dreams back then. His day, he's a wholesome, honest kid, and he's just talking to his brothers like they're friends of his, telling them these dreams, and the brothers get increasingly angrier with him in their envy, and they eventually want to kill him. Well, Reuben and Judah say, man, eh, maybe we shouldn't kill him. <laughs> you know, they had him in a cistern, an empty well, dry well, and, and Judah and Reuben say, well, maybe we shouldn't do this. And just then, a band of Ishmaelites went by, and they sold him to them. Now, Reuben had left, so he didn't know this. But these guys sell their brother to this group as a slave. He gets taken to Egypt. Uh, a guy named Potiphar buys him. Potiphar is the chief executioner in Egypt, reports to the Pharaoh. And he's got Joseph working in his house. So Joseph's working in his house not too long, and Potiphar sees it. Boy, this kid's really got his act together, you know, and everybody respects him. I'm making him in charge of everything that I got here. And then we know the story. Potiphar's wife comes on to him, and Joseph pulls away and says no. So Joseph is doing everything he can to avoid her. And she makes a real strong play for him. And he uh, runs out of the house, and she says, well, now I'm really embarrassed about this, so I've got to say that he tried to rape me. I've got to really make this look good. Now, Potiphar was a eunuch. 
Potiphar knew what his wife was like. She knew he was a eunuch and couldn't have natural relations with him. So he probably thought, you know, she's out uh, getting men on the side anyway, and so it is. Um, so it's doubtful that Potiphar believed everything that she said about Joseph. But now he's in a position, he's got to do something. Because she's telling everybody this happened. So he doesn't execute Joseph, he puts him in prison. He puts him in prison. Now Joseph did suffer in prison, because he was there seven years. And he's in prison, he gets promoted again. Now he's over everybody in the prison, even though he is a prisoner. And he tells two people that were incarcerated by Pharaoh that were direct reports of his, the chief butler, also known as the cup maker, or the cup bearer, excuse me, and the baker. They each have a dream, and Joseph says, well, let me see if God can discern your dream. He's, again, he trips everything to God. He's not me. He's, well, I'll see what I can do. And he tells the chief cup bearer, he says, you're going to be restored. You will be back at your job. And he tells the baker, you're not. Uh, within three days on Pharaoh's birthday, he's going to lift your head off and he's going to hang your body on a tree. And it was because of the security and the power grabs that are going on at the highest levels of government that the cupbearer was relatively innocent and the baker wasn't. The baker just treated his responsibilities uh, very lackadaisically. And uh, Pharaoh could not have that because any breach in his security was, could be lethal to him. So Joseph tells the cupbearer, hey, when you go to Pharaoh, go back to tell him about me. Tell him I don't belong here, man. I wasn't born into slavery. I'm, I'm not from a slave family. I came here um, <clears throat> innocently. My brother sold me into slavery, and I, they should have never done that. Well, the cupbearer doesn't do anything. It's not politically expedient for him to speak out in favor of Joseph when he and the chief executioner, Potiphar, are both direct reports to Pharaoh. He's not going to do that. Man, he just got out of prison. He's not going to now institute a controversy at, uh, at the court. So the cupbearer doesn't say anything until Pharaoh has a dream. Pharaoh's dream that we looked at a few weeks ago shows these seven lean cows that come out of the Nile and eat seven fat cows, but they stay lean. They don't get any better. And then there's seven, one stalk with seven portions of grain on it. One is good, and then another has wind-blown withering, and that eats up the stalk with the seven grains on it, and it stays withered. So the cupbearer now sees an opportunity, but he's very, very nonchalant about it. He doesn't say, oh, I know this guy that can do this. He says, you know, there was a guy in prison. Yeah, you may want to talk to him. But he doesn't go to the extent of saying he was accurate, he was good. He just sort of nonchalantly. And you can, you can see the politics involved and the power plays there. He didn't want to overcommit himself. So uh, they take Joseph out of prison and they clean him up, shave him, give him good clothes, present him to Pharaoh, and he says to Pharaoh, there's going to be a huge amount of bountiful harvest for seven years and then you're going into a famine. And this is what we're seeing here, the result of this. He gets promoted again. His dad promoted him to be overseer over his brothers, which they hated. He gets, oh, he gets promoted in Potiphar's house to be an overseer over the entire household. Now you can only imagine it. Somebody like Potiphar must have had hundreds of people in his employ. He was right. He was a direct report to Pharaoh, the greatest nation on earth at that time. And uh, he's promoted again in prison. And now he is promoted here at age 30 to be prime minister of Egypt. So he's... he's uh, out of prison, he's ruling the greatest nation in the world. And what Pharaoh does in order to make this known throughout the country, he gives him his signet ring, which is used to make an impression on treaties and other documents of, uh, of official government nature. And uh, he gives him a linen garment, he gives him a gold chain, 
and he does everything he can to push him into society and have the society recognize him. He even has a parade and he's got a royal procession, if you will, and he places Joseph in the second chariot of the realm, which is a very dignified place. Because remember, the Hyksos now are ruling Egypt, and they brought chariots in. It wasn't like the Egyptians had chariots before. This is a Hyksos uh, invention. And Joseph's got this high visibility. They even give him a new name. Uh, a Hebrew name, and they have a group of people that are running ahead of this procession, screaming out this, Joseph, Joseph, Joseph. This guy is now the Prime Minister, the Grand Viceroy of Egypt, and uh, Pharaoh then renames him, calls him Zaphonath Pania, and it, it's tough to try and figure out what the exact meaning of this, but it's something related to God speaking and living. You know, I, I couldn't find the exact uh, name for this title, but it has this essence of God speaking and God living. And uh, as an additional token to blend him into the high society and to be accepted by the ruling class in Egypt, he gives him an Egyptian wife that is the daughter of a prominent priest in their pagan polytheistic culture. So Pharaoh's doing everything he can to plug this guy into society. So he's going to have people that are willing to follow him. Just think, it's only been like 20 years since Joseph got sold, since Joseph got sold into the Ishmael, or from the Ishmaelites. Now he's at the top of society, at the very, very top of society, and he's gonna carry out this master economic plan. Just as he predicted, just as he predicted, the land produces this bumper crop, an absolute bumper crop. And um, he takes, as he said, 20% of this crop, and he distributes it around the country in a variety of cities so that it's visible and the people can see what he's doing. And they would normally have paid a 10% tax, and the 20% tax wasn't even gonna hurt them at all because of the huge bumper crops they were having for those seven years. And the collectors brought so much food into these um, storehouses that they couldn't hold it all and they couldn't count it all. They just stopped counting them so much. The country had so much. And actually, excuse me, it was 13 years. It wasn't 20 years. But during the seven years of plenty, Ozanov gave birth to two sons. And we know that the Hebrews name their children based upon important events in their life. He gave the kids two Hebrew names. They did not have Egyptian names. The firstborn was Manasseh, meaning forgetting, and Ephraim, which is doubly fruitful. And it's pretty apparent that Joseph is designating his kids related to the events that happened to him. Forgetting, forgetting all the bad that happened to him and thanking God for being doubly fruitful. God gave him everything that he has and, you know, the lesson for us here is that whatever evil we have experienced in this world, let it go. Don't hang on to it. Don't live in the past. Don't live with those previous hurts because they just won't help. It doesn't help to hang on to the bad things that have happened to us in life. That's exactly what the devil wants you to do. He'll give you these bad experiences and he wants to drag you down from being sanctified and growing in Christ's likeness. Don't do it. Do not do it. Just move on. The famine begins just as Joseph predicted seven years later. They had this plenty. And we knew that the Nile would flood periodically. And that's where they got this abundance in agriculture. Because there's no rain. Egypt's in the Sahara Desert. And except for that Nile, they don't have agriculture. I mean, now they pull water out of the Nile now, and they do some um, irrigation, but they weren't doing it back then. They were waiting for the Nile to flood, and it would flood its banks and go way, way out. And then that was the areas that they planted everything. But these eastern winds 
that they're called the Sirocco winds, they come from the Sahara and they come from Arabia, would just stop the Nile from flooding its banks and dry everything out. So this famine was severe, and the Bible says it was over the entire world, not just the Middle East, it was everywhere. And you know what, what the interesting thing that I see in this thing is, in this story, is that uh, in times of good, you should be saving for times of bad. Don't live just for the times that are good, because they're not always going to be good. I don't care who you are. Times are not always going to be good, and you need to save for when those times are going to be bad. If we give our resources to Christ and we become debt free and we save according to the biblical principles, when the bad times come, you'll have something. If you don't, you're going to have a difficult time. And look what happens to these folks in Egypt. The first thing they do when the famine comes, they complain to the government. They go to Pharaoh. It's like there's no personal responsibility here. They knew it was coming. Joseph had been telling them for seven years. They saw him storing up the grain. They saw him being elevated to this position specifically for this purpose, to save this country. You know, and it might be politically expedient for the politicians to get votes and claim they can do everything, but they can't. They can't control the weather. They can't really control the economy. You see this in Washington today, you know, everybody's yelling at the other guy about the economy. The best thing the politicians can do is to get out of the economy. Have a balanced budget and just, just scale back. A limited amount of government is the best thing for an economy. It's not the way it goes because they want control so they take increasingly more of it. When the government goes into debt, and the government borrows and borrows and borrows, it ends up crowding out private investment from the economic community. And the private investment then don't have, doesn't have enough of the available credit to uh, boost the economy up. They really, you know, the government really doesn't have any genuine control. All they can do is get out. But you know, it's interesting. What Joseph does is he doesn't give them welfare. He just doesn't start giving money out. They were warned they should have saved. He maintains strict control over the inventories and he starts selling this food. That was his plan, sell the food. And um, there's some speculation that he was selling it at some very high prices because of the demand for the food was high and the supply was low. Text doesn't really tell us that. Other company, other countries came to buy the food and Pharaoh is now realizing, man, this was really a good move. You know, we're going to survive this. Egypt had plenty and was profiting from this famine when they could have been suffering. So what happens next? In today's text, I'm going to look at Genesis 42, verses 1 to 5. Jacob, back in Canaan, is experiencing the effects of this famine. Now Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt, and Jacob said unto his sons, Why do you look one upon another? And he said, Behold, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Get you down thither and buy it for us from thence, that we may live and not die. And Joseph's ten brethren went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Benjamin, Joseph's brother, Jacob sent not with his brethren, for he said, Lest peradventure harm befall him. And the sons of Israel came to buy amongst those that came, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. So the time frame here, back in Canaan, is about 20 years since Jacob or Joseph was sold into slavery. We figure Benjamin's about 23, and remember Benjamin now was his direct blood brother from Rachel, that was Jacob's beloved wife, the one that he really loved, the one that he really wanted. And uh, the text doesn't say exactly how Jacob knew that there was food in Egypt, but you know, we haven't been through a famine. We don't know what famines are like. And uh, 
Yeah, God bless us. I hope we never have to go through one. You know, they're just terrible where there's no food, nothing. And, you know, we have at least the ability. We could go hunt here. We could grow things here. Not in a desert. You don't have that. You don't have that. There just isn't any food. And what he does is he looks at his kids. He's got these 11 kids there, and he looks at them. He says, well, what are you guys just looking at me for? Get down there and do something. And you know why they're looking at each other? Because even though it was a long time ago, they figure, oh, man, that's probably where Joseph is. I don't want to go down there. And they're all looking at each other like, not me. Oh, no, you knew you, him. You know what? They're, they're just stunned, and they're not moving. They're not moving. They, they knew what they did to him. They knew where he probably ended up, and they're still guilty. But the need for food is so great that they're just listening to their dad and saying, okay, we're going to go, we're going to go. You know, there's a description in the book of Lamentations where Jeremiah is talking about the severity of the famine after Nebuchadnezzar's third invasion of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. where women were eating their babies. You know, you look at that and you just think that's absolutely horrible and we can't imagine what a famine's like, but that gives us some insight into how bad it is. How bad it is. We just don't have that kind of experience. And again, I pray that we never do. You know, Jacob was a wealthy man by this time, extremely wealthy. He had inherited from Abraham and his dad Isaac. I mean, he had just an enormous amount of wealth and he had money. He didn't have food. It doesn't matter how much money you have if you can't have food. You know, there's an old saying, money's not everything. And it's not. It's not, but it's helpful. We all know that. It's needed. It's necessary. It's our means of exchange. But if there isn't any food, if you can't get the food, it doesn't matter if you're a zillionaire or not. It's not going to help. Now, these guys assemble a caravan and Jacob says you're leaving Benjamin here though I'm not going to suffer the loss of my other son from Rachel no way and you know the brothers had never told Jacob what really happened that they sold Joseph off in their envy and he did not want to take a chance on losing his other son he wanted to protect Benjamin so the text moves on now to talk about how Joseph is going to meet his brothers. And you know, the rest of the story of Joseph is just a fascinating story of forgiveness and reconciliation. You know, I, I can't imagine the pain and suffering that Joseph went through all those years in prison, um, getting sold into slavery. I mean, it's one thing when your brother wants to hit you in the face or something, you know, or trip you up. It's something else to sell you into bondage. So he went through an incredible amount of pain. And the text continues with, and Joseph was the governor over the land. He it was that sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brethren came and bowed down themselves to him with their faces on the earth. And Joseph saw his brethren, and he knew them, but made himself strange unto them and spake roughly with them. And he said unto them, Whence come ye? And they said, From the land of Canaan to buy food. And Joseph knew his brethren. But they knew not him. And Joseph remembered the dreams which he dreamed of them and said unto them, Ye are spies to see the nakedness of the land. Ye are come in. Now what's interesting is the text states that Joseph was the ruler over Egypt. And it gives him, or calls the governor here in my um, version, but um, the, it, it's translated from the Hebrew as hashalit. It's the only time in scripture where this verse, that this word is used. And it means just somebody having mastery over something. It's a real strong term, mastery over something. And it was his job of authorizing the dispensing of food to the citizens. Now, Joseph was the prime minister, so he wasn't actively involved in, you know, I'm going to give it to you and I'm going to give it to you. He had a lot of people working for him to do this, but somehow he knew that his brothers had come. Somebody probably said, hey, the Hebrews are even coming here. And he wanted to see them. And that's how he received them. And we re remember his dreams going way, way back. 
when he said to his brothers very innocently, you know, I had these dreams. He didn't interpret the dreams. They interpreted him. He talked about these sheaves bowing down to him. Talked about the stars and the sun and the moon bowing down to him. And um, they got really angry with him. And they said, what, we're going to be serving you someday? And he never even responded. He tells the dreams to his dad, and his dad says, so, so what? Your mother and I are going to be bowing down to you? Who are you, you know? And look what's happening. Look what's happening. This is just perfect conformity to these two dreams. You know, this must have shocked him, too, to see this. Because he was innocent with those dreams. God gave him those dreams. God wasn't telling him, and he wasn't therefore saying, Hey, I'm going to be ruler over you guys. I'm going to be in charge. He never said that. That wasn't his attitude. But he realizes who they are, and he realizes what they've done and how much they've hurt him. And he lashes out at them. He speaks really harshly to them. But we're going to see this story. Watch him soften throughout this story today where he sends them back on their way, but he's helping them. He's not harming them. But he's still suffering from the pain, and he wants to let them know about it. So he asks them, where did they come from? And, I mean, this is just natural. You know, somebody really hurts you, and now they're here. They're asking for something from you. And in this case, they didn't know him. They didn't know who he was. So he accuses them of being spies that are trying to come into the kingdom and find where their unfortified borders were or um, find some unguarded access to the food where they would steal it. And they're saying, no, no, it's not me. You know, that, no, no, we're just here to get some food. So the story continues. And they said unto him, nay, my Lord, but to buy food are thy servants come. We are all one man's sons. We are true men. Thy servants are no spies. And he said unto them, Nay, but to see the nakedness of the land ye are come. And they said, We, thy servants, are twelve brethren, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest is this day with our father, and one is not. And Joseph said unto them, That is it that I spake unto you, saying, Ye are spies. Now he's pushing hard at them. Hereby ye shall be proved by the life of Pharaoh. You should not go forth hence, except your youngest brother come hither. Send one of you, and let him fetch your brother, and he shall be bound, that your words may be proved, whether there be truth in you, or else by the life of Pharaoh, surely ye are spies. And he put them all together into a ward three days. So, I mean, they're afraid of him now. They came there to get food. And you know that they were not real anxious about going because they're sitting there looking at each other going, well, I don't, you know, we don't want to go. We don't want to do this. And Joseph is charging them with being there to steal this food. And they're trying to reaffirm their honesty. Um, and their reasoning is, uh, well, look, man, if we were a foreign power, they wouldn't send 10 people from one family. Come on. We're all brothers here. And, uh, you know, we're all from one family. So there's really no foreign uh, nation sending on this. We're not here to do any mischief. And Joseph just states it again. Now you're spies. You're spies. And um, I can see Joseph testing them to see what their attitude really was, and I can see him just letting off steam about all the things that have happened to him. And they tell him that one of their brothers is with their father. So Jacob, or, or excuse me, Joseph now knows that Benjamin's still alive and his dad's still alive, because they didn't know that. And one of them is not, means he doesn't exist. They didn't say he was dead. Well, it's a different Hebrew word for that. It would have been mot. But he says, Enachnu. Enachnu just means gone. It's like when Enoch was translated, he was raptured, he was just gone. It doesn't say that he died. It just, the same words used when Elijah went up in the chariot. He just was raised up and he's gone. So he comes, Joseph comes up with this test for them. He, he's not saying that there's no chance you're innocent. He just says, I want to test you. He's going to give them an opportunity to prove their claims. 
but he gives them something to fret over too because he's challenged them by saying you're spies, you're spies, you're spies several times. He tells them that they're going to be captive and um, except for one of them who's going to go back to Canaan and fetch the youngest brother. Now this puts them into a major dilemma. I mean, can you imagine them going back? One guy goes back and says, uh, Dad, they want Benjamin. Yeah, right. <laughs> How do you, what do you mean they want Benjamin? I'm not giving up Benjamin, you know? And so they're, he's risking, they're risking getting any food at all unless they do this. And they know when they go back, they know what their dad's going to say. Come on, man, this guy's taking you. Who are you talking to there anyway? You know, I'm not, I'm not giving up Benjamin. We'll figure out another way to get food. And if they refuse Joseph and they don't do it, then they're all going to be tried as spies, so they think, and killed. And then the family still don't get any food, so they don't know what to do. But it's interesting that Joseph puts them in a, um, a custody situation for three days. Can you imagine that conversation? Yeah, well, it's your fault. No, no, it's your fault. You shouldn't have done that. It's all, you know, I can just see them all biting at each other. <laughs> And that's exactly what happens, isn't it? Let's look at the next section of Scripture. And Joseph said unto them on the third day, This do and live, for I fear God. If ye be true men, let one of your brethren be bound in your prison house. But go ye, carry grain for the famine of your houses, and bring your youngest brother unto me. So shall your words be verified, and ye shall not die. And they did so. And they said one to another, We are verily guilty concerning our brother, and that we saw the distress of his soul when he besought us, and we would not hear. Therefore is this distress come upon us? And Reuben answered them, saying, Spake not I unto you, saying, Do not sin against the child, and ye would not hear. Therefore also behold, his blood is required. And they knew not that Joseph understood them, for there was an interpreter between them. See, Joseph was speaking to them in Egyptian, and they had an interpreter that was speaking to them in Hebrew, or whatever Canaanite religion, or, or Canaanite language they were learning. And Joseph knew exactly what they were saying. They didn't realize that. So after the three days are up, Joseph brings them back out, and here he is interrogating them again. And he says that he's a God-fearing man. He's a God-fearing man. And he's using the name of the God of the Bible. He's saying that he's not going to imprison them because there's really no clear evidence here. He's not going to punish them because I just suspect you. But he gives them this opportunity and he's going to send one of them back. And if they're honest, they'll figure out a way to bring back Benjamin. And they will not die. So they speak amongst themselves and they don't realize that Joseph understands what they're saying and they're all fighting with each other about what you, you know, was your idea and his mind and you can just see this kind of conversation going on here and they're quarreling over this and they attribute it all, all this, to the problems that they caused by incarcerating Joseph. <sighs> And if you remember back to when we were teaching through that, Joseph was in that cistern yelling and crying and pleading with them. And they were having a party. They heard him and they didn't care. God, it's just disgusting what they did. I'm surprised that Joseph even forgave them. Reuben, the one that wanted him to be released, is saying, you guys wouldn't listen to me. You went ahead and did this. And they did it after Reuben left the group. They didn't do it while Reuben was there. Reuben left the group. And what we see here is that the blood of Joseph is crying out for divine retribution of sins. And that's how, that's how Reuben characterized it. Now, Joseph is going to respond to this. And we'll close with this portion of text this morning. And he turned himself about from them and he wept. 
And he returned to them and spake to them and took Simeon from among them and bound him before their eyes. Then Joseph commanded to fill their vessels with grain and to restore every man's money into his sack and to give them provisions for the way. And thus was it done unto them. And they laded their asses with the grain and departed thence. Now Joseph is so overcome with emotion. It's like he's just got it all out. He's yelled at them. He's accused them of being spies. He knows better. But it's like he's had this cathartic experience and he's so overcome with emotion that he just gets away from them and he cries and gets it all out and then he comes back. And he probably had some comfort of getting that out and realizing that they were so guilty and realize what they'd done. He relieved his stress and then he takes Simeon and he binds Simeon up. He says, this is the one we're keeping. Now you may remember that in that incident with Dina, the rape of Dina, it was Simeon and Levi, but Simeon Moore, the chief perpetrator, to go kill everybody in Shechem. He's just a nasty guy. And uh, finally, they are requested to purchase, or they're, they're, you know, the request to purchase grain is honored. But what does Joseph do? He gives them the grain. He sends them back, but he takes their money and he puts it into their sack. He gives them their money back. And they don't even know it. Because Joseph knows when they see that money and they get back there and Jacob sees it, Jacob's going to know that there's something wholesome about this process here. This is not somebody trying to take advantage of us. It's, I don't know what's going on, but something's going on here. That Pharaoh or that prime minister of Pharaoh's gave you your money back and the grain and he wants the younger son to come. He says, I don't think this is going to be a hostile environment here. I think this is going to be an environment that we're going to be able to live in. And uh, can you imagine opening those sacks and looking and seeing? <laughs> you just bought all this food. And there's my money. There's my money. Joseph's plan of forgiveness, or God's plan of forgiveness, should I say, is underway. And you can just see the dynamics of this process, how the forgiveness works. And God has told us, if we don't forgive others their sins, he will not forgive us ours. And you've got to remember that, as hard as that is. You've got to forgive other people their sins. And here's a guy that was put in jail, sold into slavery, elevated to be prime minister. And he sees these brothers, these half-brothers too. They're not even full brothers. His only full brother was Benjamin, and he wasn't even there. And he is in the process of forgiving them. And it's so overwhelming that he starts crying and he's got to get out of there. Man, I can just imagine the emotion. Just imagine it. Shall we pray?